Father, again, we come thirsty. Uh, maybe not, Lord, as thirsty as we should be. We, we, we come thirsty, Lord, for your word. We come thirsty and hungry for you to feed us. We know, Lord, that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from your mouth. So would you uh, fill us, Lord, today as these songs have sung. Would you come and as you hovered over the surface of the water and created life, so, would, Lord, would you hover over this place and, and create life in us. Fill us with your word, Lord. Give us something to chew on necessary for our furtherance this week. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you, Carl, for Bible bag and LaShonda for those worship songs. All right, so again, we're uh, in this one topical series a year talking about the uh, unique challenges of faith for each life stage. So today we're going to talk about the challenges of midlife. Um, and I want to talk about the, those challenges uh, in, with three, three points. Number one, I want to talk about the distinct challenges of midlife. I want to talk about the importance of asking the right questions during midlife. And then I want to talk about finding deeper faith through our midlife years. All right. So the distinct challenges of midlife, and there's really four of them that I want to discuss. But uh, the midlife stage can be characterized, I think, in two ways. Um, it's a time of stability, and it's also a time of instability. So mi uh, midlife, we're talking about the, the season of life that, that many of you are in where your kids are grown, but you're not yet in retirement. Maybe you're at the peak of your career, actually. Uh, but it's just sort of this midlife stage. And so that stage, in general, can be characterized as both a stable time and an unstable time. Um, in general, the midlife stage is a stage where our, our careers have stabilized, right? We are often at our peak earning potential during midlife. Uh, we're usually at a place where we've become the ec expert in our field, maybe. We have had enough experience to know how things work and how they don't work. And at this stage of life, we're often even sought out for our knowledge and expertise in the area of our profession, okay? But although our careers have often stabilized, uh, a lot of changes are taking place in relationships during this time, uh, which make a life feel actually quite unstable at the same time. All right, so the children are grown or, um, or about grown, uh, we often, we have a new empty nest, and that can be a challenge. Uh, we, many times the children have also moved away, leading to loneliness for parents, especially uh, if, um, if they've not developed any true community beyond their nuclear, nuclear family over the years, okay? And so at this stage, parents must adjust to a new way of life in which, although our places of work may depend on us highly, our children no longer do. And this is, a, this is a challenge of midlife. Uh, our, our children are independent now, and now we wrestle with how to become less of a parent and more of a coach to our adult children. And so, so this midlife stage, stability and instability at the same time. So what I want to do in this first point is talk about the four distinct challenges of midlife and how to handle them. Uh, these, these four challenges I'm going to list probably are no surprise to anybody. Uh, these um, um, common challenges, the challenges you would expect. And so I'm going to talk about it one at a time. The first challenge is the challenge of children who fail to launch well. Okay, the challenge of children who fail to launch well. Okay, now um, the second one is the challenge of burnout with our careers. The third one is the challenge of becoming a roommate with your spouse. And then the fourth one is the challenge of spiritual drought. Okay, so let's talk about the challenge. And, and these are not uh, challenges that every person in the midlife stage will face, but they are challenges common to uh, the midlife stage. So the challenge of children who fail to launch well. Let's talk about that for a moment. Okay, uh, This first challenge is probably a greater challenge in our day and time than many other generations, and for a couple reasons. First of all, our world has become increasingly insecure for young people in the past 50 years or so, and I think everybody would agree with that. We even feel that at insecurity, right? Um, first of all, uh, well, but I, wa I want you to know that the reason for 
this increased insecurity is not so much because of wars or a more polarized country or COVID-19 or anything else. In fact, it's actually possible for young people today to launch out into uh, the uh, you know, insecurity of our time with great confidence and stability. Okay? Um, so our, our world has become in, uh, increasingly uh, insecure for young people, resulting in later and later uh, launching in life, in my opinion, primarily because a vast majority of our young people today feel they must play the God of their own life. So what do I mean by that? Well, the common uh, secular, or so we're talking about the, the, the challenge of, of your children not launching. We're going to respond to how you responded. Well, let's just talk about their challenge for a moment because this is common to midlife, okay? The common secular worldview tells young people today that your, that your life depends on you. Your future depends on you. It depends on your grades. It depends on your performance. It depends on your ability to gain a competitive advantage against the rest. It depends on your looks. It depends on your personality. It depends on your cleverness to climb the corporate ladder. It depends on going to the right school and gaining the right internships. And if you don't map out your future just right, you're going to end up a failure. Okay? And so... Okay, now nobody actually comes out and says this, but, the, but definitely uh, our young people feel like I, I, my future depends on me. And the inevitable, which is to say I, 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 I have a responsibility to be my own God, make my own decisions, make my own path, all right? And the inevitable result of sort of a godless worldview is that the individual must become their own God, and that is one massively heavy way to live. We tell our kids that everything depends on them and then wonder why they feel overwhelmed and paralyzed by fear, right? But I want, you to, I want you to know that the Christian young person can rest in the fact that the only thing that depends on me and my life is my decision to walk by faith today, okay? I don't determine my future. <laughs> I don't determine my abilities or my energies. I can't get myself a job or make a school accept me, or give myself the ability to do that job once I get it. As a Christian, I know I am a dependent creature in the hands of an awesome, awesomely loving God who says to me, Sean, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's what you need to do today. And all these things will be provided to you. The Christian young person, folks, who embraces their faith in their young adult years can learn to face life's uncertainties with confidence because they know their life does not depend on them, okay? They believe God is leading and God is strengthening at all times. But if you don't have that worldview and you think all of life depends on you, yeah, you better believe it's just going to be easier to play video games at mom and dad's house because the prospect of failure is too high, Okay? So that's the first reason many of our young children do not launch well today. They are told they must be their own God in life to succeed, and that's just overwhelming. And the second reason they don't launch well is, is very much linked to this, but it's a little different. And um, young people do not launch well because they do not seem to have the same pain tolerance uh, of previous generations. So, and the reason they don't have the same pain tolerance is primarily because they no longer have a worldview that makes sense of pain. So if you grew up in a Christian home, you learned, or you should have learned, that pain was just a part of the package, right? We've talked about that before. You learned about sin. You learned about uh, the, the rebelliousness of the human heart to disobey God resulting in human suffering. You, you even learn that pain is refining and that God actually purposes our pain sometimes to further our holiness, right? So uh, 1 Peter 4.12, Peter said, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Or James said it this way, James 1, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. 
So if you grew up in a Christian home, pain had purpose and pain resulted in hope because the awful, awful pain of the cross resulted in the awesome, awesome hope of heaven for us, right? Okay. But if you grew up in a secular home, there is nothing in your worldview that gives meaning to pain. All you can say about pain is, I don't like it. It's bad, and I want to avoid it. For this reason, many young people today have a very low pain tolerance and can't endure the inevitable pains of life because they can't make sense of pain. And they think it just shouldn't be. And so they inevitably, they develop addictions that help them what? Escape from pain, right? And hey, it's not just young people who do this. So those are two reasons why young people are failing to launch well today. They are told everything depends on them. Well, I'm just going to give up if that's the case because uh, that's, that's too heavy. And they no longer have a pain tolerance uh, that can endure this chaotic life because they no longer function from a worldview that makes sense of pain. Okay? Now, there are probably more reasons than that, but I think those are the most significant reasons for sure. So let's, let's, uh, let's say you're in your midlife years, and uh, you have a child who is very slow to launch, well, how do you deal with that? And so I want to give us, I want to give three suggestions on how to deal with that in the midlife years. First of all, you must make a mental shift in your own role as a parent. You must make a mental shift in your role as a parent. When your child uh, is an adult, it is no longer, for example, your responsibility to make their decisions for them or to make sure everything falls in place for them. It is not your responsibility to solve their problems for them. It's not your responsibility to bail them out of all the financial woes they get themselves into. It's not your responsibility to be their counselor. Okay? Your child may need a counselor, but that doesn't need to be you anymore, okay? Your child needs to work things out on their own. And that doesn't mean that you can't talk about deep and meaningful things, but it is to say that you are not the role of a counselor uh, in their life, okay? Because what often happens, folks, in the midlife years is we do not make, as parents, a mental shift in our own parenting. As a result, we parent our 20-something the same way we parented our teenager, and this results in our 20-something still acting like a teenager in our home, okay? We must make a mental shift in our own parenting if we are going to help our children launch well. So that's the first thing. The second thing we need to do is become comfortable with stress rings. Become comfortable with stress rings. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, Marcy Seether, <coughs> who's the author of the book Empty Nest, Strategies to Help Your Kids Take Flight, uh, gave a great illustration here. She said, my husband and I lived in Northern California, and he, he, he had a sawmill. He was hired to come to somebody's home to mill some trees from their property. They had this huge tree in their yard, and they wanted the tree cut down and have it milled up for their lumber package to build an addition to their house. Seemed like a perfect full circle story, she said. So John went, uh, cut the tree down, and the tree was totally useless. He told the owners that they were going to have to end up just chipping it or burning it because it could not be used to build with. And the question was why? Why was the tree useless? And she said, it's the tight rings in a tree that cause strength in a tree. But this tree never had any issues getting water. There were no other trees around it. It always, it, it always had all the sunshine it needed. It was never under any stress. And as a result, the tree grew big. It grew lush. From the outside, it looked like the perfect tree. But on the inside, all the rings were really far apart. They were widely spaced. Because when the tree is under stress, that stress causes rings. And it's the tight rings that give a tree its structural strength. And so the application of her book was this. She said, 
We as parents want to do whatever we can to help our kids avoid stress. We want to do whatever it is that relieves the stress or relieves any discomfort. We want to make sure that they have everything they need and that they never experience stress. But if we think that we're going to go through life without any tight ring years, then you pretty much guarantee that you'll be just like that tree. You're going to look nice on the outside but be structurally unfit for life. Right? And I thought that was a great illustration. Part of the mental shift that we must make in our midlife years as parents is away from the idea that it's our responsibility to take away the stresses of our children. If you take away all the stresses of your children, they will fail to develop stress rings. They will fail to become strong. Because think about it, right? Has not God made you strong through the stressful rings of your life? And isn't that the prob- primarily the only way he made you strong? Right? Folks, we have to be willing to watch our children nosedive a time or two. We have to be willing to allow them to feel stress and to go through stressful things without bailing them out. And this can be an extremely difficult transition to make in our own minds. Which leads us to the third thing we need to do in response to an adult child who's failing to launch. The first is a mental shift. Secondly, become comfortable with stress rings. And then thirdly, we must put up firm boundaries. Well, like what? We must ask of an adult child who is living at home, what are reasonable expectations for any adult living in our home, regardless if they are family or not? And whatever you feel is reasonable for every adult should be applied to your child, except in cases maybe of mental retardation or some true handicap, okay? So an example of a firm boundary is this. Every adult will contribute financially to this home. Every adult will help maintain the house and property they live in. Every adult will respect the time, space, and person of the other adults in this house. This means you can't come come in at 3 a.m. and wake us all up. You want to come in at 3 a.m., fine, don't wake us up, right? Um, Another example would be every adult will provide her own food or the money for the food to be bought. uh, Every adult will have productive employment. Firm boundaries, okay? I remember... uh, um, it was my last semester in college for my undergrad, and I was three months from graduating. It was like, it must have been January, maybe, maybe February, I was graduating in May. And, um, and I was going to graduate with two bachelor's degrees, one in business management and one in vocational ministry, okay? And so Marcy and I were married at the time, and I had, I had at that time a sudden job loss, okay? And when I lost my job... I was diligently trying to find a job to fill the gap before graduation because we had bills to pay. But after two weeks of looking, I discovered that people didn't want to hire me because I'd been honest about graduating in three months. And who wants to invest in me for three months and then have me gone, right? And the only place that would hire me for such a short period of time was McDonald's. So guess what? I worked at McDonald's for three months. With two bachelor's degrees? Yeah, with two bachelor's degrees, right? Folks, a very healthy boundary for your young adult is anyone living in this house will have productive employment. I don't care if you have to work at McDonald's with two college degrees to make it happen. We have to set firm boundaries for our adult children if they're going to launch well, okay? Um, All right, so we're going to stop there on on the challenge of children who fail to launch well because we've got three others to talk about here. Uh, So now let's talk about the challenge of uh, burnout with our careers. This is a challenge of the midlife years as well. In the midlife stage, we have often been in our career for many years, and if we feel burnout with our jobs, it's usually because one of four things are true. Number one, we work too long every day, and too hard. That's not the way God designed us to work. Secondly, we do not take regular vacations. So we don't get a break, right? Number three, we are always controlled by the tyranny of the urgent, making uh, work feel always stressful and burdensome. 
Uh, or number four, uh, we, have, uh, we, we used work as a stress reliever from home life, and therefore we've spent way too much time at work unnecessarily. And so we had a poor work-rest balance. Uh, well, so actually all those were under a poor work-rest balance. We work too long. We don't take vacations. We're always controlled by the tyranny of the urgent. And uh, we've used work as a stress reliever to stay away from home and just spend too much time there as a result. Now, a second reason we begin to feel burnout at this stage is we're not, we're not working according to our giftedness. And I see this a lot, too. So we've been in a job that we feel is contrary to our created design. We're, we're not extroverted, for example, but we've been in sales for 10 years. Or uh, we feel extremely uncomfortable listening to people's problems, yet we've been, in the human, we've been the human resource manager for a decade. Okay? You're not working according to your giftedness. You're just not, and that's just stressful just being there, right? That can lead to burnout. You're not working according to your giftedness. A third reason for burnout at this stage is you, you, you've had a stunted view of the purpose of work. So you've believed, and this is common to Christians, you've believed that only work that is, quote, spiritual work has any real value in this life. You've been building homes for years, for example, thinking that the only thing that is good about building homes is the occasional spiritual conversation you get to have with a homeowner or employee. You fail to see that God himself is a worker. Work was part of God's good design for the world. In fact, the very first task God gave to Adam to do in this world was to work the ground. And so, you know... Um, One second, just skip to page. Um, so maybe you're burnt out because you've thought about work as a necessary evil rather than as a part of God's good design. And, and therefore, your, your, your enthusiasm for work has just sapped because you feel like I'm just wasting my time 40 hours a week, not seeing that if you are doing work that is good and contributes positively to mankind... That is God's design for work. Your work in and of itself, even if it doesn't involve daily conversations about Christ, is still good and meaningful. That's the biblical perspective on work. Okay, so you've thought you were wasting your time uh, when you've really not been. And, and so that, that um, you've, you've had sort of a stunted view of the purpose of work and you've lost your energy for it. Um, thirdly, uh, we have the challenge, um, well, okay, so that, that's, that's the challenge of burnout with our careers, okay? It's usually for uh, uh, those three reasons, poor work-rest balance, uh, you're not working according to your giftedness, or you're not viewing your work correctly. So we have the challenge of children who fail to launch well. We have the challenge of burnout with our careers that surfaces in our midlife years. And then thirdly, we have the challenge of becoming a roommate with your spouse, so many times, couples find that when the children depart for school or work or, or the military, they no longer uh, have anything in common with each other. Uh, they made the kids the thing that united them, the thing they have in common. And so once the kids leave, well, we're, you know, we're living with the stranger who's sleeping in the same bed with me, right? Uh, and so what makes this separation uh, radiantly clear at this stage is the fact that husband and wife now have a lot more time together without other people to distract them from each other. <laughs> you know, the house is quiet. Uh, we don't know what to do with each other at night. And so we're realizing that we have, that what united us was the kids. And this can be a challenge. And so what becomes necessary at this point in time is for husband and wife to begin to rekindle their marriage separate from the kids. Now, the marriage began before the kids, but somehow we made the marriage about the kids, and that's extremely unhealthy, okay? Um, and so many times, uh, this will require a marriage counselor. Oftentimes, too much water has gone under the bridge to really uh, be one again without some help. Uh, this is uh, a, a common challenge to the midlife age. Um, all right, so children who fail to launch well. Burnout with our careers, becoming a roommate with your spouse, 
And then lastly, we have the challenge of spiritual drought. The challenge of spiritual drought. So many times the midlife stage is the stage when we realize that we've neglected the growth of our marriage and the growth of our relationship with God. And so life got busy, right? Uh, we, we felt we had no time. We let work consume us and failed to develop a healthy work-life balance. We let poor, a poor church experience be an excuse for not needing to be involved in a church, right? We stopped reading our Bible. We stopped praying. And now, with more time on our hands, we're recognizing our spiritual drought, okay? This is why churches tend to be heavy on the midlife slash retirement age groups and light on young adults. Or midlife is when we begin to recognize our spiritual drought. Okay? So if we were to list the top four distinct challenges to spiritual growth in the midlife stage, those would probably be them. Number one, children who fail to launch well, burnout, becoming roommates with your spouse, and then lastly, spiritual drought. Now let's talk now about, and this won't be as long as this last one, um, about asking the right questions during midlife. A um, couple years ago, we did a whole series on the book of Ecclesiastes, and uh, we looked at the different interpretive approaches to Ecclesiastes. And so one approach to Ecclesiastes that I want to focus on for a minute is the idea that Solomon, as the author, writes as sort of a teacher who employs the Socratic method of teaching in order to get his point across. So what is the Socratic method? The, Socra the Socratic method basically uh, asks more questions and gives less answers. Okay? In fact, the word Ecclesiastes comes from the very first verse of Ecclesiastes, chapter 1, which says, uh, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Well, the English designation Ecclesiastes is derived from the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, and Kohoeth, or Ecclesiastes in English, can be translated to mean preacher, or speaker, philosopher, or teacher. Okay. So one interpretive approach to Ecclesiastes is to view Solomon as a teacher who employs the Socratic method in his teaching. He asks questions more than gives answers. And so Solomon says in chapter 1, verse 3, What do people gain from all the labor at which they toil under the sun? And then he follows that question with a number of observations. Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. What's the point of it all? Solomon is saying, um, well, th th that's what he's saying. He's, he's just asking the question, what's the point of it all? It, it, all, all the water just goes back to the same place, right? Uh, the, wind, the wind turns and goes south, heads north, and it does it all the time. There's nothing new under the sun, so what's the point of it all? And so if the preacher of Ecclesiastes is more like a teacher or seminar leader who employs the Socratic method, then what he's most concerned with in his teaching is asking us the right questions rather than giving us the right answers, and I think, in my opinion, that's an outstanding way to teach. So, like, for example, what if every class you took began with the right questions rather than the right answers? So what if at the beginning of every science class, for example, we asked the right questions? What if instead of just jumping into discovery, we asked, what after all is the purpose of discovery? Where does it lead us? To what end are all our discoveries? What if before we jumped into a work of classical literature in English, we asked, what purpose, after all, does literature serve in the life of humanity? Why should we care? Right? Uh, what, if we went, um, what if before we went to work each morning, we asked, what, after all, is work about? Am I really just making money? What's the point of it all? Okay? And the reality is... Uh, we do ask these questions, but we tend to ask them only after the fact. In fact, there may be some of us here this morning or listening online who are 
now turning to faith in your aged years because you're looking back at all you've done and finally asking the right question. What was that all for? Right? I made money. I experienced good things. I had the boats. I had the cars. I had the dirt bikes and vacations. I went camping. I went to Disney. I went to Six Flags. I did everything my culture said was important for me to do. But why? We ask it, but only after we've done it. Uh, and this is the same with the preacher in Ecclesiastes. He's done it all, and he says, what was it all for? Okay. Uh, so the preacher said in chapter 2, verse 4, I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing, flourishing trees. Yet... When I surveyed all that my hands had done, when I looked back at my life and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind, nothing was gained under the sun. So in the book of Ecclesiastes, the, the, I believe the preacher is uh, likely in his midlife stage looking back at life and all he has experienced and finally asking the right questions, what was it all for? What's the meaning of everything I've done thus far in life? And so consider what would be the result in our lives if we looked forward first and asked the questions before. What if we started with the right questions in life instead of just ending with them? And so uh, what if life in Laconia launched out of the right questions? So what if our young people ask, why do I want to go to college? What's it for? What should it be about that would actually make it a meaningful endeavor? No, we just go to college and we ask those questions later, right? Or uh, what, if, what if the young professional asked, why do I want to be an attorney? What should attorney work be about if it were to honor Christ? Or why do I want to be a police officer? What should policing be about in this city? If it were to be an activity which honored Christ, what form should it take? What form should it not take? Why do I want to be a business owner? What should business be about in our city if it were to be a use of my time that honored and exalted Christ? What sort of business would I start? What sort of business would I not start? What if we started life with the right questions and then filled in the blanks, right? And the fact is, folks, most people do not ask deep enough questions of their life prior to beginning their life's work. And so, like the preacher, they get to midlife and say, what the heck was all that for? And this, I believe, is, is, a, is a significant message of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes leads us to ask the right questions of life before we've lived life on all, all the wrong ends, <laughs> okay? And people who come to the midlife stage, if they've not asked the right questions before, they usually start to now. So what has all my life work been about? What was all the huffing and puffing for? What value did it have? What did I really gain? Was any of it glorying to God, glorifying to God, or was I just pleasing my own fancies for the past 30 years? Right? So I believe, folks, that the midlife stage ought to be the stage where we finally begin to ask the right questions of life if we've not asked them before, which leads us to our last point. So we talked about the distinct challenges of midlife, asking the right questions during midlife, and now let's close with finding deeper faith through midlife. Um, a recurring phrase in the book of Ecclesiastes is the phrase, under the sun. And it appears 27 times in Ecclesiastes. So, for example, Ecclesiastes 1.3, what do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? Chapter uh, 1, verse 9, what has been, what has been will be again what uh, has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Ecclesiastes 1.14. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless of chasing after the wind. So over and over and over again, the preacher uses the phrase under the sun. Uh, and so some Bible scholars believe that Ecclesiastes is a sort of commentary or exp uh, expansive on the, med uh, on, on the fall. So um, they believe that Ecclesiastes describes in detail the consequences of life on earth 
after the fall. So life is hard after the fall. It's toilsome. It's meaningless. It's confusing. It's burdensome. Life comes seemingly without purpose sometimes. Because after the fall, <clears throat> life, because life uh, uh, after the fall, uh, um, uh, life under the sun has become what God never intended it to be, okay? And unless it can return to its original state, life under the sun will be one long experience of meaninglessness. That's kind of what Solomon is saying, okay? And I think that's right. If, if this life is all there is, if the scientists are right that there is no life beyond this life, then not only will our experience of life feel meaningless, it will actually be meaningless. If there is no life beyond uh, life under this sun, everything in truth is utterly meaningless, and it is illogical and philosophically, uh, psychologically deceptive to say that it's anything but truly meaningless. I mean, so let's not kid ourselves. Let's not try to make up a meaning. Let's just be honest and call a spade a spade. If there is no other life after this life under the sun, everything is utterly meaningless, right? But what if life under the sun is not the only life there is? What if this life under the sun is really just a foretaste of the life under the true sun one day? Well, that's exactly what the Bible teaches, right? The Bible teaches us that because of the fall, everyone experiences this life as burdensome and toilsome, but then it tells us that life under Jesus Christ, the true son, is whole and complete and meaningful. The Bible tells us that God saw what we did to his perfect world, how we made it uh, burdensome and toilsome and meaningless with our sin. But in his great love for us, God entered the world we broke. In the person of Jesus Christ, he came and reversed its curse. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ, the one and only Superman, entered the world to save it. And while on the cross saving the world, the most absurd thing happened. What was that? The watching world looked at the cross and thought Jesus died meaninglessly. They thought it was all for naught. They thought it was wasted. They thought his life was now good for nothing. But on the cross is where Jesus made everything new, right? On the, on the cross, death got reversed. On the cross, God's purpose for mankind was restored. On the cross, our burdens and weariness were swallowed up in the hope that now, because of Jesus' sacrifice, we shall inherit a new heaven and a new earth one day where the sun, that is Christ, will never set again. There will be no night. There will be no hard toil. There will be no pain. And because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, Nothing in this life will ultimately prove to be meaningless at all. For in truth, if you're a Christian today, then everything you do under the sun in this life, if you do it for Jesus and to Jesus and through Jesus and by Jesus and because of Jesus and to the praise and glory of Jesus Christ, then all of it shall be remembered in heaven and you shall never be forgotten. The preacher is right. Under this sun, you will be forgotten. But if you submit your entire life and will to Christ, the Son of God, his promise is that he will never forget you. Life under this sun proves to have deep, eternal meaning each new day, folks, as long as each new day is surrendered to Jesus Christ. And so maybe, maybe you've reached the midlife stage today and feel like Solomon felt, that all of your labor has been meaningless up till now. What have I gained? I'm not even wealthy. <laughs> but I worked my fingers to the bone, right? Well, in truth, it is meaningless if there is no God and if we have no firm hope of life beyond. But if you're a Christian, then all your work and all your labor, no matter how laborious it has been or how seemingly directionless it has felt at times, all of your labor, if done for Christ and to Christ and because of Christ shall one day reap a reward. You shall not be forgotten, though your life's work, like Solomon's life's work, did not continue. It shall not all have proven to be meaningless if you've come to ask the right questions with this right answer. What's it all for? It's all for him. Amen. And so as we prepare to surround community again today, let me ask you, 
Is it time for a midlife redirection for you? Has your work and labor up to this point felt meaningless because you failed to work for the Lord and not for men? Have you failed to look at your work as good in and of itself, even if every day it does not result in spiritual conversation? Okay? Has your problem been not the work you have done, but the way you've done the work you've done? You thought you were just wasting time, but in truth, you could have been glorifying God in the activity of your work if it proceeded or if it produced something good for mankind and in the relationships you fostered there? Have you failed to respond well to a child that's been slow to launch? What new boundaries do you need to set up? What mental changes do you need to make as a parent? Have you let your relationship with your spouse become a roommate relationship? And what next steps can you take to rekindle that romance? Have you let your relationship with God slip because you gave it every excuse in the book? I'm too busy. I don't need to be preached at. (laughs) I don't need to gather with other people to have a relationship with God. I like American Christianity where it's all about me and God and a Bible and that's all I need. Have you failed to ask the right questions of life? Are you like the preacher of Ecclesiastes, finally asking the right questions and seeing the need for a redirection? Has life up to this point been about you? Or has life, including your work, been about Christ? Are you a Christian today? Does the Holy Spirit reside in you and animate your emotion, your, your motivations and your actions? Is your life fully surrendered to Christ, as our mission statement says, or is it just uh, partially surrendered to Christ? What do you need to lay down today? If you're not a Christian, then maybe it's time to get saved today. Confess your belief in Jesus Christ that, that he did for you what you could never do for yourself and effectively reverse the curse both for you and the world. Confess your belief in him and secure that confession in that great ceremony of baptism. What is your next step today? All right, we're going to have a time of communion now as the music plays. And we're going to form two lines. And perhaps it's appropriate for you to come spend some time at the front and uh, uh, committing to a redirection in your life. Maybe you need to be prayed for. Uh, I will be over here to the right. Maureen will be to the left. Maybe there's someone you need to go to and and talk with and uh, uh, pray with or just share with. What's your next step of faith today? Let's stand and commune together. At the right time, we will take the emblems together as we return to our seats.